Yes. Looking forward to that. Thank, thank you. you so much. Well, thank you for having me. So it's indeed it's the last of the day. So I was like outside and I saw like a lot of people already drinking beers and stuff. So I was like, I hope that there are still people in the room. So thank you for listening. So this is like last year my, my colleague Etienne was here and he, he presented for the first time Weaviate and what we're trying to do. And we've done a lot in a year. So today I wanna um, I wanna show you actually an update and, and way more things about Weaviate and a lot of things have changed, also the things that we've changed into. So quickly in the agenda what I want to talk about. So first I want to talk about what it is, because we're you know we're new, we're new on the scene. So eh? so what is it? Secondly, I want to talk about what has changed since last year what was presented here and this year. Um, I want to talk a little bit of the about the technology, and last but not least, of course, I want to give a demo. I want to show it in action. All right, so that's the uh, that's what I'm going to do. So first about the um, about Weaviate. So Weaviate is an open source smart graph. That's what it is. And what we mean with that, well, the fact that it's open source, that is the usual suspects, right? So source lives on GitHub, but you can use that uh, using Docker, Docker Compose, and Kubernetes. So we have that all out of the box for you. It is smart because of something which we call the contextionary. And if you never heard about the contextionary, that's fine because we invented it. And I'm about to explain to you what it is and what it does. Um, and I want to use, I'm going to use one buzzword, sorry for that, but what I, but it, it has a serious, it's, it has a serious notion. So sometimes people talk about like the AI first architectures. So like, can we build systems that have like these machine learning models built into them? That we can build new solutions and execute new ideas. And that's what we try to solve with semantic models. So what makes it in our case, what we like to call smart is the built-in semantic model. And the graph is, well, I don't have to, in this room, I don't have to you know, share to people what the graph is, but the, we, uh, we've chosen to use GraphQL. And the reason why I've done that is because we see, of course, there's like a lot of uh, graph experts, you know, use Sparkle or Cypher, or those kind of things. But sometimes when we have developers who find it a little bit more difficult, uh, we see that they really like to work with GraphQL. So we really embrace GraphQL and it's like completely 100% GraphQL based. So that's how we define what our smart graph is. And with a smart graph, you can do three things. First thing is semantic search. So what you can do, and that's also what I will demo to you, what we know from traditional search, if I may call it like that, we search for keywords, right? So if we write about um, uh, uh, the company Apple, we actually need to search for Apple. But in WeVH, you don't necessarily have to. So if you add a company with the name Apple, but you search, for example, what's the, company, the business related to the iPhone, it will still find your data object, company with the name Apple. What we also can do based on that is automatic classification. So we can automatically make edges in the graph based on the semantics of your data object. And last but not least, we can do knowledge representation. And this is often what's always also referred as like nowadays, it's like uh, it's the knowledge graph, but it's like, I wouldn't say we're necessarily a knowledge graph, but the, you can create those similar uh, uh, representations. So those are the three things, the three use cases that we can help you with. So, Something important to share um, uh, based on what we did last year. So um, the best way to explain is a little bit on time. And what I mean with that is like that we saw, of course, a lot of databases in the past that were more relational based, right? So just, you know, um, a row, uh, column uh, row column structures and tables. And then, of course, we got these um, uh, graph databases. Eh? So for example, the people from Naor in the room, so they made a beautiful uh, beautiful database like that. And we chose a year back to store our information with Janus. And what we did was that we had that semantic element that what I will explain, the context there, that I will explain what that is. We had that as a feature. But last year we decided to just double down on that semantic element. So we got completely rid of the, um, uh, the implementation in Janus and we created basically everything ourselves. And we, that means that we now only have that context to store that information in. And we've actually, this is a crown, so we actually figured out like this is actually, we're really happy that we made that decision <laughs> because now we could really bring something new, you know, to the, to the stage, something different and a different way to handle your data objects and work with them. So we store everything in a semantic space. That's what we do. And now if you go like, what, semantic space? I'm going to explain what we mean with that. So, but just keep thinking when I talk about semantic space, I'm talking about the contextionary. So, imagine it like this. If you go to a, um, uh, I'm compliant, as you can see. 
let's say if you go to a grocery store and you have a shopping list and on that shopping list you might have four items a banana um, washing powder you're looking for an apple and a piece of bread so if you go in the uh, supermarket and you find the banana you know that an apple is going to be closer by than the bread or uh, the washing powder and if you move towards the bread you know that you're actually getting closer to the washing powder and moving more away from the fruit that's how we store data in the space and so that's the metaphor to actually imprint um, uh, the problem that we solve and we do that to something that we that we call the contextionary and I want to give you a little bit of background where we're coming from and um, uh, what's different to other um, uh, solutions that are around here so if you go all the way back again time to the uh, uh, to the 1950s it was like a famous quote and it said like a word can be characterized by the company it keeps and what it basically means that you would say that the word Paris would be more closely related to France than it would be to um, uh, Holland, for example, or the US. And New York would be more closely related to the US than, uh, uh, for example, uh, Spain. And that basically went for all words. And a lot of research was done there, and then we jumped forward, and then with the whole machine learning boom, we saw there was a lot of work being done with, um, with based on machine learning and these word embeddings. And then what we also saw there was, uh, there was like, we got first word to vac, got glove, and nowadays uh, what they call in the academic realm, which they call a state of the art, it's called BERT. But if we now put on our engineering hat, we really fell in love with glove. And why did we fall in love with glove? Because BERT has multiple representations of a word in that data set, but glove doesn't. Glove has one vector representation for every word. And the critique that it often got was that, well, if you, for example, have the name Apple, Apple can mean, of course, um, fruit, but it can also mean uh, the company. And, um, but we wanted to solve the problem in a different way, but as engineers, we were very happy with this because now we could index it. We could index those words in a uh, storage mechanism. So if you start a WeVH, you can imagine it like this. It's an empty space that you start, you choose a language, not a programming language, but a spoken language. So let's say, for example, English. And uh, the space is filled with all those words. So, for example, if you find apple, you find nearby fruit, you find nearby company, uh, and you might also find iPhone. And these representations that we store, they have a 600-dimensional representation, which is very fancy, but just it has to do with compression, that kind of stuff. Um, and the thing that we did is this. If you store a data object like this, so for example, the class company with the name Apple founded in 1976, et cetera, and in, when I demo, I will show you how that actually works. But if you store the information, what Weavier does is that it creates a string of the words and the concepts that are in there, and it takes those concepts and it funnels them down. How does it do that? It says like it takes the Euclidean distance, it combines it with the, uh, it's, this sounds very fancy, but with the logarithmic function based among the occurrence of the word. So for example, company uh, might occur less often than the word apple. So then we say the word company is more important. And then we even work with word boosting so that you can say certain words are important in my data object. But what we do with that is that we create our first, uh, uh, our first object in our graph and it gets its own vector representation. So now if we have an empty Reviate with those words in that, and we store our first um, uh, data object, as you can see there, there it is, it lives, that's where it lives in the vector space. That's what we mean. So now if we query for, let's say, um, a company and iPhone, it can look in the nearby space and find the data object. So now, without even having iPhone in a data object, we can still find it. And that's the thing that we created. That we thought, like, hey, this is, this is our thing, right? This is our, our golden goose egg. Because now we have different ways of creating graphs and actually query through them. So this example, for example, might look something like this. So if I have a, a data set with companies, and this would be my GraphQL query, where I say, that, Get, give me things which are companies, and I want to have their names, but explore them by iPhone, I might get this result, Apple. And as you see, iPhone is nowhere in the data object. And if I have that same da da data set, then I would say, oh, well, a little bit more abstract, organize these companies 
um, uh, on the concept of Redmond, I might get back Microsoft. And that's how we structure our graph. So, um, and that, so that's basically what, what we've hit is. And as a developer, we've hit comes with a few features. So the first thing is that's that confectionery comes all out of the box. You don't have to do your training. You don't have to set it up, whatever. It comes all out of the box, um, or basically all out of the container, I should say. Um, adding data happens to the HTTP API, but crawling data to the GraphQL API. It's completely containerized, so you can run it wherever you want. Um, and because we use that vector space, it's very, very scalable. You can scale this, that space very, very tremendously big. So I think the, the biggest one that we ever tried was a few, was a few billions. It, it gets pretty big. And something that we have in the pipeline, and maybe I can show you that next year, but is that we also can create peer-to-peer -peer networks of VVAs. So that we can point to semantic elements in different graphs so that we don't have to agree anymore on our ontologies or on our schemas. But that's like, that's, that's in the making. So a little bit about GraphQL. So I have, so when I demo that, so how we structure our uh, GraphQL. This is the, um, uh, uh, the UX, if you will, of our GraphQL. So we have a get function first. The other one is an aggregate function, but I'm going to talk about the get function. We have a semantic kind, which we make a distinction between things and actions, nouns and verbs. We have the class. The class has the property. A property might have a reference and then the property itself. And what you can do, you can have these semantic filters on top of that. So there here you see, for example, the explore uh, filter, and then you can search for concepts. But you can even move away from concepts of move towards concepts. And I'm, I will demo that to you in a bit. Um, ah, well, demo. So now we get to the demo. So now you might want to say, how does that actually look? So what I did is that I spun up a, um, uh, a, a Docker container. If you want to do that yourself, if you go to our website, semi.technology, and then you simply click Weaviate, and then you find all the documentation. Um, the installation gives you just a Weaviate, but what I'm going to demo to you is this news publications data set. And if you click that one, there's just one simple Docker Compose command that you can run that you can play you know, around with it yourself. So there's a meta endpoint, which I'm just running just to make sure. Yes, so that is running well. So let's first look at the schema. So this is an example of a schema. So here you see I have the class publication, and I have, I have the name, name, so the name of the publication. But for example, oh, so I set uh, the headquarter geolocation, which is our geo coordinates, has articles, et cetera, et cetera. This is how we structure the schema. The sch that's important because we will see that back when we use GraphQL to query. And the things that we actually store look like this. So for example, here you see an article. The article has an ID. A beacon is a reference in our graph, but why do we call it beacon? Because we do it in the space, so it's a beacon in the space. And then here you see, for example, a summary of the article, the title of the article, and the URL where the article actually comes from. So that's how it's structured. So we've created a simple um, uh, uh, GUI that you can use to actually uh, you know, look through and search through the, uh, through the graph, so you can visualize stuff, but I want to I wanna dive into the um, uh, the GraphQL queries. So let me show you a simple query. So if I say get things and I want to have uh, I want to have a publication and I want to see the name, this would be a, a valid query. Then you see well, I see Vogue, Financial Times, Wired, New York, The Economist, etc. Now what I now can do is that I can say, well, I want to oh, I want to explore for uh, the concept let's say business and I'm going to limit it to three results just that it's easier readable so I now say do the same query but explore based on the concepts of business so if I now run this query you see Financial Times, the New York Times, the International New York Times etc but you see the word business the, the meta tag it's nowhere there that's what comes from the contextionary or if I would say fashion and I would run it then you see it starts for example with Vogue so that's how we've structured it and how it works. Um, but that's not, not only going for like small strings, but also for larger, larger text objects. So for example, if I would say get things article, and I would say show me the title of the article, and I run the query, so now you see all these articles about uh, a variety of topics. Uh, uh, you see <laughs> Brexit, so you can see when we, when we um, actually pulled that in. <laughs> 
but it's just a variety of topics in here. But if I now say, well, I want to have those articles, I'm going to use the explore function again. And I, I say, well, I want to explore for the concepts, let's say, um, music. And I'm going to limit the results again just for the sake of readability. So same query, but now based on the articles. So if I run this, you say, like, you say fair enough, the first one has the word musical, but then it's about uh, Gwen Stefani, and then it's about John Lennon. So you see the word music is not necessarily in there, but it organizes it like that automatically. So now even if you want to filter further in this, uh, in this graph, what you can do is that you can say, well, um, the, the question we had, like, so how do we do pagination? Because if you have a 600-dimensional space, what would be the next uh, um, uh, page? So what we've done uh, is this. So we said, well, we can actually, for example, move towards a concept. So I can say, well, um, move towards the concept, for example, of the Beatles. So I guess you already know what will happen if I do that. So, and I give it a certain force. The force is how strongly you want to push towards this concept inside the vector space. So let's say, it's a little bit arbitrary, but let's say 85%. So if I do that now, you see that John Lennon, the article with John Lennon comes first. And if I say, like, I'm more like a Stones person, I hate the Beatles, then, of course, you can also do move away from the concept of the Beatles. Same query, and we see um, John Lennon is gone. And now the question is, like, okay, so what makes it... So, like, now the traditional graph people are going like, yeah, but I haven't seen really the graph in action yet, so that's just very simple, because you could say, for example, has authors, and then we can say on author, um, the author has a name, so this is how we structure the graph. So now you see, huh? so you see the graph object here. That is first the title of the article, and it has authors, and then actually the authors that are related to this um, to this article. Um, I think if time allows it, there's one more thing. Can, can I still quickly show one more thing? Yes. So the, uh, there's one more thing which I completely forgot because there's another problem that we also tried to solve with this, and I want to show you that going back to the publications. So quickly going back to the publications. Things, publication, and then I say a name of the publication. When, uh, when you glanced over this, you might have noticed that we have all these publications, but we have the International New York Times, the New York Times company, and the New York Times in there three times, which is a problem because, of course, you want to represent concepts, but in a database, we have the same concept represented three times. So we have something for that. Um, what we can do is that we can say, well, we want to group concepts together. So then we say, I'm going to do the type, merge them together. I'm going to give a force, so how big do we need to look in the vector space before merging? And then I can say, well, do that with 5%. So if I now run this query, you'll see that it merged together the International New York Times, New York Times Company, and the New York Times. But if I now do a graph query, so I say, has articles on article, the title of the article, it even now merges together those different articles from those different publications into the same concept. So that's what we have. That's how it works. Uh, oh, way more features, the automatic classification. I didn't even get to show you that, but you can play around with it because, well, we're at FastDem, so this software is open source. <laughs> you can play around with it. You can set it up yourself. You can create your own graphs, uh, or semantic graphs, I should say. Uh, that's my story in a nutshell. Thank you all for listening. And um, if you like it, and if you go to our website, then I just have one question. Uh, so this is our website. If you go here, then you can sign up to our newsletter if you want to learn, or you can click on the GitHub star button if you want to. I uh, will promote it a little bit. So that's, uh, but this is our website. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, Thank you. Uh, that was a very great last talk for our dev group. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Um, Thank you. For the idea, of course. Uh, I actually have two questions. Uh, you said that your semantic, uh, so let's say, embedding are based on graphs, but for larger text sentences, would you do a simple averaging? Uh, because globe is a word uh, embedding uh, model. And the second question is, <coughs> I guess, so you showed us in examples query based on single words, but can we actually input uh, a sentence? And in that case, I suppose, 
your model will have to cook up uh, a vector embedding for that. Is that actually sustainable if I put it on a server and then everybody tries to you know, run your model uh, to get their embedding? How do you solve that? Yeah. So two questions, sorry about that. No, no, but, uh, why are you sorry about it? So no, that those are great questions. So let me, let me start with the first uh, answer to the first question. So, um, and, and sorry if I went to over that quickly, uh, too quickly, because it's, um, um, and this whole, everything what I told is also on the website in detail. Um, but that's what's happening here. We always knew, use the same algorithm. So if you would have a data object with a longer sentence, like for example the summary or the title of the articles that you've seen, it applies the same um, uh, uh, algorithm. So it says like first I take all these individual words, then I find the center position between those words, then I weigh them based on the occurrence, so certain words are seen as more important than others, so it weighs it towards that. Um, and then we have this optional word boosting that you can say, well in this specific case this word is very important, so move more towards that. That's how we create those vector positions. So regardless if you're querying or if you're um, um, uh, um, adding data, that's how we do it. So that's why we also became agnostic about the fact that gloves about single words. And because we learned that if we, so we, the first prototype we did way back was very simple. We say, okay, I have the word apple. Show me what's nearby. And then as you would expect, as Glove does, it says like, well, I found iPhone, but I also f found fruit. And then we did something very simple. We said, okay, now go and sit in the center between Apple and iPhone. Show me again what happens. And then you see actually um, um, uh, that that's successful. And if I, if I may, I can actually sh quickly show that. Yeah, I'm the last talker, so. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. Shit, I should have waited till you had said go ahead. And then, thank you. So um, there's a contextionary endpoint uh, where you can say, well, concepts. So if I now literally do what I just said, so if I would say uh, Apple, then you see here Apple, iTunes, Google Preview. On this, and now, of course, in this example, we don't see, uh, of course, the fruit. But let's say if I would do Apple and not based on the company, but on fruit. So I concatenate them, Apple and fruit. You see how it now starts to get better and better in those results. So, and that's how it, the algorithm works. So you can play around with this also yourself on this uh, on this endpoint. And the other question? Yeah, it was uh, since this, uh, I guess that the weights, now that I you know, better look at the slide, are kind of uh, CSIDS weights, in a sense, that we do on the frequency. So if, and you have to, you know, cook up these uh, vectors for the embedding every time we make a query. Is this sustainable for a normal server? Do you have some solutions there yeah, sure. So we, um, um, we of course, we're also like, uh, we're also a, a business. So we have like, uh, the, so the core is like open source, but we built like a shell around that. So we currently have six companies using this on a large scale in, in a variety of industries, uh, wholesale, retail, um, oil and gas, all those kind of things. And these graphs get pretty big. And especially if you scale the Kubernetes cluster, it's fast, which is something I'm, now I could say that we fancily like architected that, but it was actually something we got for free because we just, the data model is just vectors, only vectors. And that's of course very fast to scale and to search through. So the answer to that question is yes. Uh, can you use this for translation? Uh, like you said, you, your, your vector space um, is built in one language, but can you compare vector spaces by uh, looking if one concept is associated with, with all these things, and in your second vector space, another concept is also associated with the, the same things, and you've already linked some, some concepts. Can you translate, use that for translation? I don't know, and I love the idea. So we're definitely gonna try that out. I don't know, I don't know, it's a great idea. We, we, haven't, we haven't tried that yet, so. What we currently do is that we just have, we have a review in, in a language. So um, uh, Dutch, French, uh, English, uh, of course. Um, uh, but we haven't tried that yet. So um, if you don't mind, then it would be fantastic to, or of course you can try that yourself, or we can do it together, but that would be fantastic. It's a, it's a great idea and I don't know. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, with that, uh, we are officially over with the dev team. Nice talk at the end. Um, yeah, I hope you all enjoyed it. Uh, enjoy Postem tomorrow. Enjoy the evening, of course, and uh, maybe uh, see you next week.
Thank you. Thank you.